Now let us move on to the next definition that is assessment year section 2 9. It means the period of 12 months commencing on 1st April every year as simple as this. 12 months commencing on 1st of April. So now um, in the present scenario when has um, the assessment year started very simple on 1st of April 2019. So therefore, we have the assessment year from this date to the next 12 months that is 31-3-2020. So the assessment year running is 19 and 20. This will be our assessment year. Now what is assessment year then? It is nothing but the financial year. So what is the financial year which is currently uh, active? It is 1920 that itself will be our assessment year. So now what is the significance of assessment year? Very simple. Whatever you earn in the year previous to the assessment year will be taxed in the assessment year. Now which is the year previous to this 1920? That will be nothing other than 1890. Now which is the year which is previous to year 1920? Which is none other than the year 1890. So this will become our previous year. Whatever income the assessee has earned during the year 1819 will be taxed and filed in the year 1920 which is our assessment year. But there are few exceptions to this rule wherein your previous year income is filed in the assessment year. Of course taxed as well as written filing will also happen in the assessment year. But what are these exceptions now? income of non-resident from shipping. So if there is any non-resident who is into shipping business, then his income will be taxed in the previous year itself. Income of persons leaving India, very importantly, permanently or for a long duration. Let's say there is a Mr. A who is leaving India in the previous year 1890 permanently. So can we expect that person to file the income in assessment year 1920 definitely not possible because you would have left in the previous year itself. So in such cases what we do is we will ask them to file the return in that previous year itself and not wait until the next assessment year. Then income of bodies formed for a short duration. Let's say there is a, a special uh, artificial judicial person which was established on 1-4-2018 and it was um, dissolved on 31 7 2018 so that means that itself is um, not in exist or will not be in existence in the next assessment year so in such a scenario we will ask them to file the return not in the assessment year but in the previous year itself then income of person trying to alienate his assets with a view to over tax that means he is shifting the burden or he is shifting the assets to maybe his spouse or parents etc. In such cases what we do is we will ask the SSC to file the return in the previous year itself. And income of discontinued business. If there is any business which was in existence for a long period but discontinued in the previous year then the return will be filed in the previous year itself. Next let us look into the next definition that is uh, previous year section 3. Income tax is payable on the income which is earned during the previous year, they say. So we just not looked at the assessment year, which is none other than our financial year. So which is the financial year active? 1920. So which is the year previous to this? 1819. This itself is our previous year. So whatever income we earn during that previous year will be taxed in the next assessment year. That's all. So now let us say someone uh, started earning sometime in the middle of the previous year. Let's say the previous year always starts on 1st of April and ends on uh, 31st of March. But in this case the SSC started uh, earning maybe uh, that person qualified as a company secretary on August 25th and he started earning from the month of September. So he would have earned from September to March. In this case for the SSD, the previous year would be 1st September, let's assume the year is 2000, 
eighteen to thirty first March two thousand nineteen. So whenever he starts to earn his income, that is when his previous year will start. From next year onwards, it will be always from first to thirty first March. The next important definition is that of income, section two, subsection twenty four of the Act. Income is the consumption of savings opportunity gained by an entity within a specified time frame. So there are various definitions, of course, but generally when we say income, we always refer to some periodical monetary return with some sort of regularity. But that is the layman's definitions. Whereas when it comes to Income Tax Act, even when the income does not arise regularly, like for instance winnings from lottery or crossword puzzle, even then. income tax act treats that as income so here the regularity does not come into picture at all so now in case of income tax act it has been defined as to what is an income so now income includes that's what the definition says profits and gains dividend voluntary contributions profits and gains we know usually occurs in any business whereas dividend again you may be a shareholder of some company so in that case you will get dividend from that company that is also considered as an income of course there is an exemption available for that so we'll look into that later then we have voluntary contributions let's say yours is a trust or some charitable organization in that case you will be receiving voluntary contributions even that will be considered as income the value of any perquisite or profit in lieu of salary profit instead of salary maybe let's say car is given to you by the company or maybe hostel facilities given to you for your children by the company or the quarters is given by the company to you in such cases even that will be quantified in terms of money and will be taxed in the hands of assessee any special allowance or benefit specifically granted to the assessee to meet the expenses Uh, with regard to the performance of the duties, for example, let's say transport allowance. In this case, this transport allowance is given for the purpose of meeting the day-to-day um, -day requirements of the SSC. So even then, this will be taxable as income. City compensatory allowance, DNS allowance, something which is generally part of the salary uh, as a compensation. Uh, for the what we can we say is inflation in such cases we tax such incomes as well benefit or perquisite to a director it's not just for the employees also for the director given by company any benefits by whatever name called will also be considered as income any benefit or perquisite to a representative assessee so not just the regular assessee even if you are representative of someone else and you are receiving such benefits even then it will be taxable then we have various sections from 28 41 and 59 these are all related to profits from business or profession so if you have any income from business or profession such will be covered under these provisions then we have capital gain so let's say you have some old property uh, let's say um, which was passed down to you by your grandfather in that case let's say you sell it so on that property you will receive some amount of gain so that is uh, uh, taxed under the head capital gains it could be either long term capital gain or short term capital gain uh, depending on the uh, time frame of the asset if you have any insurance profit from insurance business even that will be considered as income from income for the assessee banking from a cooperative society winnings from lottery so this is definitely not regular so this is something which can be classified as irregular but even then it is taxable as income so income tax act does not necessarily care about the regularity employees actually this is employers contribution towards provident fund let's say uh, miss a is employed by a company uh, infosys limited in this case infosys limited would be uh, contributing towards the pf of the employee miss a so such contribution to pf will be considered as income income received under any keyman insurance policy uh, generally companies um, get such policies done for the employees and if employees any uh, if employees are receiving any amount out of that even that will be considered as 
income. Amount issued for not carrying out any activity. Let's say you have some business and someone pays you some amount not to carry on that business or not to carry on a particular service. In such cases, that also will be considered as income. Gift received for an amount exceeding 50,000. If in an year, if you receive more than 50,000 rupees as gift, so that entire amount would be considered as income. Consideration, uh, consideration received for issue of shares. So if you sell shares and if you receive any consideration on that also, it will be, uh, I mean, that also will be considered as income. Amount received as an advance or otherwise for in the course of negotiation for transfer of a capital asset. So generally what used to happen, people would just uh, pay the advance and later on they would postpone the contract. So and then they would avoid the payment of tax and to curb such practices what uh, the Income Tax Act has done is even if you receive an advance also, even that will be considered as uh, income. So these are some of the major incomes which we uh, have as part of the definition and what is most interesting is the act does not differentiate between how you are receiving such income it could be received in cash or in kind so whether you receive in cash or in kind doesn't really make any difference to the act so both will be treated as income in the hands of the assessee then receipt basis or accrual basis sometimes what happens let's say the march month's salary let's say march 2019 so the assessee did, does not receive the salary in the month of March 2019 itself. But does the act say that this salary which is received in the next month, let's say April, is taxable in the next year? Definitely not. It would still be taxable in the previous year, 1819 itself. Because um, according to the Income Tax Act, whenever it arises, either receipt or accrual, so whichever comes first. So whichever is first will be considered and then taxed accordingly. Legal or illegal source. Let's say you are making income out of, let's assume, some smuggling business, smuggling activity rather. So will the Income Tax Act tax that? Definitely, yes. Even that will be considered as income and tax. Of course, you will be penalized under different uh, various other acts, but under the Income Tax Act, so that would still be considered as income and you would be required to make the payment of tax on that. Temporary or permanent. So even if there is a temporary income, even then it will be considered as taxable. Doesn't really... Uh, so periodicity is not important it need not be periodical lump sum or installments income whether received in lump sum or installment uh, so for example let's say someone has not received the salary for five years due to some legal dispute so then they receive together so what is this lump sum amount so in that case also it will be taxed as salary then gifts we have already seen uh, up to 50,000 it is exempt the moment it crosses 50,000 entire amount shall be taxable. So there are of course various provisions we will look into these provisions when we take up the head income from other sources. Revenue or capital receipt it tax on income and does not tax every in item of money received as the name itself says it should be a revenue receipt. Generally, only the revenue receipts are chargeable for tax. Let's say you receive some amount by way of a will. So in that case, it will not be taxed. But in some cases, even capital receipts will be taxed. We'll look into that later. Now let us look at the important factors that do not determine the nature or character of the receipt. So capital or revenue receipt, revenue nature of a receipt must be determined with reference to each receipt. That means you will have to look at each uh, receipt case by case on the basis of the facts and circumstances of each case. So now there are various uh, decisions, pronouncements by the High Courts and uh, Supreme Court of India. So based on that we have certain uh, points here which we have to keep in mind to decide whether a particular receipt is a capital or a revenue receipt. Now let us look at the things which does not determine the character of a receipt as to whether it is a revenue receipt or a capital receipt. 
the following things will not affect the nature of the receipt character and source of the income so now in whose hands uh, is it being treated as revenue or capital in the hands of the recipient so we are mostly worried about how it is treated in the hands of the recipient and not in the hands of the payer so the, for the payer it might be a revenue or it might be a capital item but what is it to the recipient that is what is most important for us to determine whether it is a revenue receipt or a capital receipt then uh, in fact let us look at one of the examples given here uh, let's say we purchase a machine when you purchase a machine so what is it to the payer for the payer it is a capital item he makes the payment and he purchases a machine for him it is capital whereas for us it is a revenue item because our main business is to buy and sell machines when we buy and sell machines it is our day to day business there is no way it can be treated as capital item and the second aspect is with regard to the application application means for what purpose we will utilize that let's say we have received some amount by way of salary we may utilize to buy groceries or we may utilize to buy some asset or maybe something else doesn't really matter whether you buy groceries or car or furniture for us what matters is the nature of this item that is the income not exactly not necessarily how you apply that particular income next is allowance or disallowance of the amount to the payer let's say a receives something from b now a is the recipient and b is the payer b has paid professional fees to a now for some reason maybe b has not deducted the tds this professional fees paid by the payer that is b is disallowed that means it is not treated as an expenditure in the hands of b now does that mean a shall not treat that as income definitely not doesn't really matter whether it is being disallowed or allowed for the payer what matters is what is the nature of the receipt for the receiver in this case a for him it is a professional fees it doesn't really matter as to whether it was disallowed in the hands of b or not next treatment given in the books so now let's say someone might receive um, professional fees and let's say a practicing cs has received professional fees and he treats that as capital item does it make this professional fees a capital item again definitely not because doesn't really matter as to how this particular cs treats that income we are only looking at the nature of the income here so otherwise every time he receives professional income then he will start treating that as capital item which is definitely incorrect so here we should be very careful as to ignore the treatment given in the books of the recipient or for that matter payer magnitude and the method of payment a person might receive a salary of 1 crore or he might get something by way of a will of rupees 10000 in this case this small amount becomes capital and this becomes revenue so what is immaterial is the magnitude that is the size or the nature or the quantity of the amount which we receive in this case what is important is in fact the once again nature there are various examples please go through these examples which explain the above situations which doesn't change the nature of the receipt next charge of income charge of income tax section 4 this in fact is the backbone of the entire act because this is the section which gives the powers to levy the income tax that means unless we have this section we cannot impose the tax on any ssc so let us see what this section says it says income tax shall be charged at the rate or rates prescribed in the finance act for the relevant previous year that means the rates shall always be prescribed in the financial act 
so that's why we always wait for the budget finance act is nothing but the budget itself so in the budget we have this uh, these rates for the particular uh, previous year based on that the tax will be levied the charge of the tax is on various persons specified under section 231 that means we have already looked at the definition of person so now this charge is on none other than those persons it could be an individual company op boy etc the income sought to be taxed is that of the previous year and not that of the assessment year that means not of financial year but of the year before that for example right now which is the financial year which is running 1920 so are we charging the income of financial year definitely not then what are we charging we are charging the income of the previous year to this year which will be 2018-19 so from where do we uh, get these powers to levy tax on the SSE from section 4 the levy of tax on the SSE is on its total or taxable income computed accordance in accordance with the various provisions of the act so first we have to calculate total income on the total income based on the rates prescribed for various persons based on the rates prescribed in the financial act for the relevant previous year we will charge income tax residential status section 6 again one of the most important sections because unless we know the residential status of a person in India during the previous year we will not be able to compute the tax because entire computation stands on the residential status so whether that person is resident or not based on that we determine the amount of tax to be paid by that particular person of course this residential status is always um, always considered for the previous year for example now right now the assessment year is or the financial year is 2019-20 so we are worried about the previous year 2018-19 as to what was the residential status of the assessee here one thing which we should uh, remember or notice residential status is not the same as being the citizen of a country one may be a citizen of the country and still not be a resident one may not be a citizen of the country and still be a resident according to the income tax act now let us look at the classification According to the residential status, the SSC could be either resident or non-resident. Very simple classification. Either you are resident or non-resident. So if you are a non-resident, there is no other classification. But if you are a resident, then we have further classification. Especially in case of individual or HUF. You could be resident and ordinarily resident. Resident and ordinarily resident or resident but not ordinarily resident so resident and ordinarily resident resident but not ordinarily resident whereas in case of non-resident as i said earlier no such subclassification in case of other persons other than individual and hf there is no such subclassification for non -res sorry resident either you are this that is resident or you are non-resident one of these now let us look at the test of residency this is of course for individuals there are two basic conditions which individual has to follow there are two basic conditions which an individual may fulfill so if you fulfill either of these then you will be treated as a resident first is you should have stayed in India for a period of 182 days or more that means greater than or equal to 182 days in the previous year for instance in the present scenario since our assessment year right now is assessment year 1920 the previous year would be 2018-19 so what is this condition is saying is from 1-4-2018 to 31 3 2019 that is in the previous year the individual should have stayed in India for a period of at least 182 days that is greater than or equal to 182 days if this condition is fulfilled then the person would be treated as resident or that means let's say someone is not able to fulfill this condition in that case we'll look at the second basic condition which says 
the resident sorry the assessee should have stayed in india for a period of 365 days or more once again greater than or equal to 365 days in the four years preceding the previous year that means let us say our assessment year right now is 2019-20 previous year of course would be 2018-19 now we should calculate four preceding previous years so just we'll go back uh, four times 17-18 16 17 15 16 and 14 15 so these are the four preceding previous years and the condition says 365 days or more in the four preceding previous year so here he should have stayed for at least 365 days not only that on top of that he should have at least stayed for 60 days in the previous year so 60 days here and 365 days in the four preceding previous year so this 60 days condition plus 365 goes together it's not either or once again so an SSE to be considered as resident should satisfy two conditions. these are all called two basic conditions so one is he should have stayed in India for a period of 182 days or more that's it as simple as that when in the previous year which is the previous year for us 1819 let us assume he is not able to satisfy then we will look at the second basic condition which says he should have stayed in India for a period of 365 days when in the four years preceding the previous year so which is the previous year for us 1819 which are the four preceding previous year four years before that 17 18 16 17 15 16 and 14 15 so how many days in those four years 365 is it sufficient definitely not then what 365 plus 60 in the previous year both put together if he satisfies that condition even then he will be treated as a resident